Hello and welcome to the first episode of season four of the Lebanese Politics Podcast. My name is Nizar Hassan, joined as usual by Benjamin Red, and the usual guest of honor, Taymour Azhari, is here with big news today. Hello, Taymour. Hello, Ben. How are you guys doing? Hey, what's up? Hey, good, good. How about you? So, Taymour is officially um, not a guest anymore on the podcast. Starting this season, he's going to be the third co-host of the podcast. So, Timur, how do you feel about that first, you know, like, tell us uh, about it. Yeah, no, <laughs> feels great. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I've been on like a few times and, you know, I've, I've become very close to you guys through that process. So it's uh, it's very, very nice to know that uh, we'll be together more often. Yeah, we are, we're super excited to have you. Uh, congrats uh, also on your other new job that you you just started with the Thompson Reuters Foundation uh, and and we are really really super excited to see what you're going to be producing there and then also just to have you here on the podcast with us I, I mean you've been sort of like a natural fit where it, just so that the listeners know basically whenever Nizar and I and and Susan whenever we would run into an issue and we didn't have a guest for the next day we would uh, call up Taymor. Uh, and invariably he was, uh, he would make time for us and come on and help us out in the past. So th this was, uh, sort of a natural fit for him to come on officially and join the podcast. Yep. It's great to know that I was always the last choice. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for bringing me on in a more, <laughs> more, uh, permanent capacity. <laughs> no, honestly, jokes aside, I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to now be part of this uh on a more regular basis i i you know a huge fan of the podcast in addition to coming on it several times um i think it you know it does a it, it fills a a gap in in the in you know in the english language news scene in lebanon and uh yeah i really look forward to being uh to being with you guys from now on all right well now that we have all of the happy good news out of the way uh shall we get into <laughs> the, the meat of the podcast for this week uh because it's not looking good. Uh, we've got a whole lot of things going on. And uh, it, it, if you are listening to this and you're in a really good mood right now, I, I would caution you that we're going to be updating several things. And, and unfortunately, there just really isn't a whole lot of good news out there. There's a whole lot that's happened since we last came to you in December. And the situation has gotten uh, a lot worse in a lot of different ways, uh, starting with coronavirus to begin with. Uh, so, you know, we've been on uh, a strict lockdown since January 14th. That's because the government decided and the, the authorities decided to open the country over the holidays, which everyone knew was a massive mistake. We knew the numbers were headed in the wrong direction. They decided, uh, apparently under lobbying pressure from like nightclub owners, that they would go ahead and open the country. For the holidays, uh, they pushed back the curfew to 3 a.m., which led to an insane situation where uh, there was a curfew in the country, but it was only two hours long, and it was 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., um, and, and I have no idea if it was even enforced. I didn't go out to check to see if there were ISF people, you know, trying to stop people at, you know, 3 a.m. from uh, uh, going around the country, uh, but I, I mean, it didn't really matter, right? Uh, they they open the country for the holidays. And then predictably and tragically, we saw this huge surge in coronavirus infections and then in hospitalizations. And now we're seeing it in deaths, just just an enormous wave uh, from this pandemic. And so if you remember back, you know, back to middle of December or so when they were making these decisions, Back then, new infections had barely broken like the 2,000 uh, mark per day. Uh, but then uh, on New Year's Eve, the same night that a whole bunch of people went to parties uh, uh, and, and all of this stuff, we saw a huge jump in infections, 3,507 infections that same day. Uh, and, and then we saw the new infections continue their rise and they ended up peaking on the 15th of January 
over 6,000, 6,154 new infections were reported that day. Um, and, and, and so you can actually, you can get a sense for the, the scale of this surge uh, of COVID-19 uh, just by looking at sort of like adding up all of the new infections prior to 2021 and during this current year so far. And we're, we're only, you know, a month and a few days into it so far. Essentially, 43% of all infections from COVID in Lebanon happened this year. It's about three in every seven. And then not only that, you know, it's not just the new infections, but then you see uh, increased pressure on hospitals. So uh, back when the Interior Ministry issued guidance that pushed the curfew back to 3, 3 a.m., that was on the 21st of December, it went into effect the 23rd. ICUs, you know, were, they were already like 80 percent occupied and they had 410 people in them on the day that the Interior Ministry issued this uh, directive. One month later those the people in ICUs had actually doubled more than doubled to 864 uh which put enormous strain on the health system you know uh because they didn't have this capacity so they had to ramp up this ICU capacity an, an enormous undertaking they managed it seems to stay ahead of the curve uh albeit barely uh they, they did i think uh in certain areas eventually reach 100% though of ICU capacity so not really right and then also after we see this huge, huge surge in hospitalizations, uh, now we're seeing like the number of deaths uh, has followed. Um, and, and basically half of all COVID-19 deaths have happened this year, uh, wh wh which is insane. We're, we're talking, you know, 10, more than 10 months in, in 2020 uh, saw the same number of deaths as uh, a month and a few days in 2021. Yeah, and I, I guess the the important thing to state here, and I think that Lorient, you know, Lorient today has done a very good job of explaining this. Is this this was basically, you know, we we could see that this was going to happen. It's it's the chronicle of a death foretold, and you know now uh, we're we're having to deal uh, with the with the consequences of this decision to just open up the country over New Year. I mean, in a, at a time when the rest of the world was sort of closing down and. And officials were telling citizens that they had to stay home and, you know, that, you know, they should just sit this Christmas out. Uh, Lebanon just completely opened. You know, the, the curfew from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. is sort of uh, ridiculous. Uh, you know, it was a ridiculous measure in and of itself. Um, and so, you know, now we are in, in, in the midst of this lockdown. Uh, we, we started with that light lockdown on the 8th of January. And then uh, on the 14th, it turned into this very strict lockdown with the 24 hour curfew where basically you can't go out for any other reason apart from emergencies. Uh, you have to get your groceries delivered to you. you. You mentioned authorities, you know, they sort of like snapped back like, oh, shit, something went terribly, terribly wrong and predictably wrong. So now we need to lock down. So they announced this, you know, light lockdown on January 8th, like you said, and then like, oh, shit, no, it's really serious. We need to fully lock down on January 14th. Well, OK, so if you're just looking at uh, the health side of things, right, then uh, so far, it's been good because the number of infections, at very least, has been flattened a bit. Before, you know, at, at sort of the height of the surge, we were seeing daily infection numbers in anywhere from the 3,000s to the 6,000s. But now we're just seeing it in the 2,000s to the 3,000s, which is good. That's really good. But if you remember back to what I said earlier, you know, 2000s that's when things really took off back uh in december so we're we're not even back to square one yet we're it, it, it's still quite early just speaking from a health perspective it's still very very early to be looking at reopening because we haven't even dealt with the entirety of this surge yet and 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 just to add on to that as well the local positivity rates the number of local pcr tests that come back positive has remained stubbornly high. So, so I mean, it was it was high before. You know, it was usually like in the teens, uh, back uh, I believe in like November, December, and now it is on a regular basis in the twenty percent uh, range, which usually indicates that there's a lot more infections out there that aren't being caught. The testing capacity isn't up to snuff. So yeah, we are seeing fewer numbers actually test positive, but there's a lot of questions about how much more spread is going on that we're not seeing right now. 
So now we're in this phase of the gradual reopening. Um, and so as of Monday, the country enters the first phase of a four phase reopening, each phase lasting two weeks. Um, and that means that basically supermarkets can reopen and, and banks at about 20%. Um, so people can go out for those things. And really the rationale here is, is that even though health experts are saying we should remain closed for longer and, and we really need uh, to remain locked down for at least another week, um, the, the economic sort of angle to this has, uh, the economic pressure has just uh, become too much. It, it already was too much. Um, and so, so what we're seeing in a way is kind of a, a way to gradually open the economy while in effect maintaining a, a soft lockdown. You know, the 24 hour curfew remains in place for two more weeks. Um, but, you know, a few sectors are allowed to open. And, and we kind of saw, uh, you know, the, an, an event that happened in the north of the country that I think really is in, you know, in, in the, in the national conscious as, as we go into this uh, phase reopening. And that was the, the protests in Tripoli. So two two weeks ago we had uh, these these protests uh, in in Tripoli. Um, they they were basically began uh, on on a Monday, and it was it was during this lockdown that basically forced all businesses to close, uh, forced people to stay home, um, and and really did impact those on on the lower income side of things more than more than anyone else uh, because you you weren't even allowed to go to the supermarket. You had to order your food home by delivery. Many people can't afford that. And so what we started seeing was these, these gatherings in Tripoli's, uh, Sehat al Nur, uh, the, uh, officially the Abd uh, Hamid Karami Square, um, which was really a center of the, you know, Lebanese uprising of October 2019. And, and over a few days, these, the numbers grew. Um, and, and we did see the, the protests start to turn violent. You had a, a crackdown by security forces. You had some protesters throwing rocks and other projectiles. You had a group of people trying to break into an official building, the city's Sarai, and also the municipality was eventually set on fire. Um, and over these, these, uh, these, this week long, this week of protests, which was really about rising po poverty, uh, deprivation, and a lack of any government aid during this lockdown. We, we saw uh, them turn very violent. Um, 400 people, uh, roughly, were injured uh, over this week. And one person, unfortunately, was confirmed dead. Um, Omar Taiba, uh, he, he died when he was shot in the back. Uh, and and this, was, this happened when security forces were cracking down uh, on protests that, that did turn into riots at night. Um, and so the exact circumstances of, of uh, Omar's death are unclear. Um, the ISF has not denied killing him. Uh, they have expressed regret, but they haven't confirmed it either. Um, and several other protesters were also shot with live ammo. Uh, security forces did use live ammunition. This was captured on, on the TV. And we did see bullets sort of pinging off of the ground, pinging off of buildings, and several people lying on the ground with injuries afterwards. This was broadcast on live TV. Now, security, security forces say that, uh, that, uh, you know, it, it was more than just rocks being thrown at them. Uh, they posted several pictures of grenades, sort of Soviet era anti-personnel grenades online and said that, uh, some of the grenades had exploded. Um, we, we weren't able to uh, independently verify this, but that is what the, the ISF are saying. And, and I think the point here was that, you know, if we're talking about the COVID crisis being sort of a chronicle of, of death foretold. This is another thing which we saw coming. Uh, we 100% expected these protests to arise in a situation where you have a total nationwide lockdown in a period where more than 50% of the pop population are poor. Um, and at the same time, there's no government aid provided. Um, and so then, you know, it's, it's extremely likely that you will see these protests, especially in a trip, a city like Tripoli, which is really a, a city uh, of billionaires and brooks, uh, extreme wealth inequality. It's one of the poorest cities on the Mediterranean. And at the same time, uh, a number of Lebanon's most, most wealthy people are from that city. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. And, and the level of government support, we, we, we did learn that the government did support a little bit, right? Uh, there were these 400,000 lira disbursements that the army apparently started making on January 25th during the lockdown. But I, I mean, a one time payment of 400,000 is not going to get anyone uh, really anywhere. And especially if you're not widely distributing this, giving it to a lot of people. I mean, you know, it, if 
of somewhere roughly of at least a third of the population needs this, then it's not going to you're you're not going to be able to have any effect by having a very limited program. It needs to be much more uh much uh much broader, much more massive, a much larger push and probably more money than just four hundred thousand. It was just it was too little too late. Um, and and what we saw again was these narratives emerge from politicians very quickly, uh, be it the prime minister designate, be it, uh, you know, area politicians like Najib Miati, who is also a billionaire, uh, basically saying that these protesters were either paid by sort of dark, shadowy uh, political forces or even other countries. Uh, all of these uh, accusations that we have heard over and over again uh, in the past 18 months uh, during the country's uprising. Uh, these are, of course, allegations for which no evidence is ever presented, and they do fit a convenient narrative because these protesters largely oppose the political class. They oppose these same politicians who who come out and and accuse them of sort of being paid or or being in in effect traitors to the country. Now, and I think one of the the sort of starkest examples of of this kind of rhetoric was uh, was Najib Miati, the the former prime minister and and billionaire saying that you know if the army didn't step in he would take up arms to defend his uh, institutions in the city yeah th which was absolutely wild right so you see uh you, uh, Mikati has taken an approach uh sort of akin to Rafiq Hariri you know like uh, come in he he's not coming from this you know long line of family who's been you know as i one way or another for centuries or anything he, he came in with money and now he's saying, well, now maybe I'm going to go another route, which is arming myself, which is another way that uh, people, you know, gain power in this country. I, I mean, it was it was really, really surprising for those of us who have observed Mikati uh, over, you know, the past several years, you know, to see him basically open that door, which is, you know, a very scary door, uh, given Lebanon's history, given the history of the Civil War. And the things that have happened before that and since, and uh, really, it just goes to show you that the these people who are in power, they they will protect what they believe is theirs by whatever means necessary. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I was less surprised than to be honest, because I mean, while there's nothing very explicit about Mikati, you know, having military activities, when you talk to people in Tripoli and Bevet Ben, etc., his name is not, is a very common name uh, when discussing. Uh, politicians that had a role, uh, uh, that allegedly had a role in, in funding uh, the clashes that used to happen in Tripoli uh, between Baba Tabin and Jabal Mahsan for a while. And uh, Meqati is, is, is known to be one of the politicians that liked to, liked to uh, operate more underground than, you know, uh, in public. He's, he keeps, he maintains a certain, um, a certain, uh, like, uh, image publicly as a politician who is a former prime minister who has to be, you know, at a certain level. At the same time, um, his real political leverage, apart from him being one of the oligarchs in Lebanon, is, uh, I mean, in terms of popularity, is what he has in Tripoli in terms of support, popular support and uh, credentials as a Sunni politician. And to get that in Tripoli, you don't own, you're not only, you know, um, investing in charity and, and uh, clientelist networks, etc. You also need to show that you're strong enough to um, to face the other warlords and the other oligarchs in Tripoli as well. So it's not like it's it's a new field for him. But it's what's interesting is that it kind of you know like he showed his teeth in my opinion more than anything. It was this moment where uh, his own people, the working class of Tripoli, who he supposedly has uh, he thinks maybe he has in his pockets. Uh, revolted against him and the, the other the politicians in the city, and this was his response. So between that and Hariri's conspiracy theory and all politicians, um, I mean, all of this conspiracy theory kind of uh, discourse by most politicians, basically people of Tripoli were kind of left alone in this. That's how I saw it. It was uh, like the people who are supposed to speak on behalf or, or to kind of... Um, bring out the voice of of Tripoli's people were the ones to uh, betray it first under the pretext of, uh, you know, refusing violence and riots, etc. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's very clear that you have those who are benefiting from where Tripoli is today and those who are um, very um, disadvantaged by it. And this was, you know, clearly a conflict with a lot of um, class dimension.
Yeah, and I think it's also important to remember that you know what happened in 2016 uh, in, in the municipal elections. All of the Zuama of Tripoli, you know, they they got defeated in the polls. Ashraf Rifi came in uh, with his list and decimated them in the municipal elections, and and really largely that can be read as I. I I, I think uh, quite convincingly, it can be read as a rejection of these Zayims, these uh, billionaires, uh, this ruling class back in 2016. And that was entirely peaceful. And then you have what happened in 2018 with actual protests against, you know, the entire ruling class in Lebanon, but also against uh, the, the the rulers there in Tripoli. And now we're seeing yet again people rejecting these rulers, but doing so in, you know, well, it didn't work at the ballot box. It didn't work in the streets normally. And now uh, things are getting even more violent than uh, than before. I mean, this is going in one direction. And the rulers up in Tripoli, the, these, you know, these tycoons, they don't seem to be doing anything different. They seem to think that, you know, stay the course. Uh, we'll be able to put down whatever whatever comes up against us, whatever, you know, popular unrest there is, we'll be able to deal with it and not actually have to make any sort of substantive change in our plans or actually, you know, really investing money uh, into the city. Yeah, and I'd say that what what his statement and also the events in, in Tripoli kind of show and, and, you know, kind of pour into is is a rising sense of insecurity uh, and and lawlessness in Lebanon. And I think that last week we had just sort of the latest example of this with the news on Thursday that Lachman Slim, you know, a publisher, a publisher, an intellectual and a prominent critic of Hezbollah uh, was found dead, was found killed in his car uh, in South Lebanon with several bullets uh, in his head. Yes, this uh, tragic news was um, probably the biggest piece of news uh, since we last recorded. Um, so Lachman Slim, He's not a very famous person. He wasn't a very famous person, maybe to to a lot of people, but in certain circles he was. He was known to be, you know, a fierce critic of Hezbollah, but his main work revolves around uh, publishing, around um, uh, documenting and archiving, especially the history of uh, the civil war, but also things related to, you know, uh, prisons in in uh, Arab totalitarian regimes and, uh, 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 you know, specific incidents uh, in history. But the main way he was described after the assassination was uh, as a fierce Hezbollah critic. And this is for a very um, valid reason, which is that recently most of the political com commentary that uh, Lukman Slim has been writing and, and speaking was about Hezbollah and the need to limit its power um, uh, in Lebanon. Um, and also because uh, the, the, the last moment when his name was kind of went viral was in 2019 when his house was kind of raided by protesters um, who uh, were chanting uh, slogans against him accusing him of being uh, you know a traitor and uh, an Israeli collaborator and all of that and back then one of the posters hung on the wall of his house uh, said glory to the silencer the silencer usually used uh, in Arabic as the gun silencer, right? Cat and so, so the, the the kind of the parallelism between that and the way that he was killed was kind of very telling. But also the fact that the people who were protesting at his house were um, Hezbollah and Amal supporters, and the area where he was assassinated is known to be militarily, in terms of intelligence. Um, completely dominated by Hezbollah, as well as politically, of course. And also, after that incident in 2019, Slim uh, wrote a public letter calling on security forces and the army to protect his life, to hold, like to be responsible for protecting his life from now on, because he felt under threat. And he said that any harm that might happen to him, uh, basically, he held uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of uh, the Hezbollah, and Nabih Bire, the leader of the Amal movement, responsible for any harm that might come to him. Uh, and this is why most of the political reactions um, either directly or indirectly were concerned with which political actor kind of co uh, committed this assassination or ordered this assassination and for groups and politicians that are against Hezbollah and and uh, you know for political opponents of Hezbollah 
um, most of the reactions of the political actions were, you know, indirect or like accusations. And then on the other hand, the more pro Hezbollah field, uh, be it, you know, people who, uh, to, who are on the left or in Hezbollah and its uh, allies, etc., the reaction or the framing of, of the incident was maybe this is a false flag attack uh, meant to, you know, incite uh, more hatred towards Hezbollah and incite civil strife in Lebanon, you know, by the usual enemies, U.S. and Israel, etc. So there was this usual, very, very common, very familiar uh, division or polarization in the reaction to this incident, uh, one that we saw many times before, especially that most of the people who were assassinated in the last you know 15 years in lebanon uh, they were assassinated at sensitive polit sensitive moments politically and they were most of them were anti hezbollah or anti syrian regime in their political orientation or political activity so it always you know uh, urged the question of who is committing is does hezbollah have a role in this does syrian regime have a role in this and Obviously, investigations never led to anywhere. So all we have is political accusations. And now with Luqman, with Luqman Slim, we also have just political accusations because when it comes to investigations, uh, no one from across the political spectrum actually believes that the official uh, security forces in Lebanon are going to conduct a transparent investigation and tell us who killed Luqman Slim. Right. I mean, you know, the background to Lokman Slim's killing is that we in Lebanon have, a, a, you know, more than a dozen uh, assassinations or attempted assassinations over the past two decades uh, that for which no one has ever been ac held accountable. Um, and, and, you know, the only one which we, we sort of do have uh, a verdict for is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, uh, which adjudicated the, the, the assassination in 2005 of former Prime Minister Rafi Hadiri. Who was held, uh, you know, who, who was found guilty of that? A, a Hezbollah operative. Um, and the special tribunal at the time, you know, of, of laying down the verdict said that this was likely a political crime. Um, and so fingers are pointed at Hezbollah, but at this point, we don't have any information. We don't have any evidence. And people aren't confident that there will be any evidence. There's sort of this history of impunity in Lebanon. And, and that is, you know, I, I think Lokman Slim's, uh, you know, the, the reaction to Lokman Slim's killing was especially strong because it fell on the same day uh, that marked six months since the Beirut blast, you know, the, the port explosion that killed 200 people. It injured more than 6,000 and it really destroyed vast parts of the capital city. And six months later, we still have no answers. Uh, we have far more questions than answers, actually. And so, you know, that the investigation into that explosion has been paused since December 17th. That's 53 days. Um, and, and basically, you know, we, we've spoken about this before, uh, but just a quick recap is that the, the reason it was paused that day is that two suspects, you know, MPs Ali Hassan Khalil and Ghazi Zaitar, basically filed a motion to have uh, the, the investigative judge, Fadi Sawan, removed from the case. Um, and he had charged them and, you know, the, the current caretaker, Prime Minister Hassan Diab, with criminal negligence in the blast. So, you know, the, the, the investigation is paused because of the motion of, uh, by these two suspects. And then comes the COVID lockdown in, in early January, which in effect stopped all judicial proceedings. Um, and so, so one then decides that he's not going to summon anyone for investigation, nor really continue to, to continue with the probe in effect until the lockdown is over because he can't send any you know court summons he can't sum he, he can't bring people in for investigation nor can he travel anywhere for investigation that's his uh, you know his opinion on the matter um there are other opinions including of the justice minister Mary Claude Nejem, who I who I just spoke to who said that actually you know urgent criminal matters can go ahead and should go ahead and so there's a question there of why he decided to to pause this investigation but in effect, we're in a position now where six months later, we have zero accountability for, you know, for the victims. And we're even in a place where rights groups, including Human Rights Watch, have, have now said that there are serious concerns about due process violations regarding the actual people detained in connection with the blast. So there were 25 people detained and somewhere above 30 people charged. And those people have been detained for six months. And many of them, actually, their lawyers say, don't know the charges against them. And that is actually a violation of international standards on due process. Um, and so I, I under, you know, it, it's, it's not a populist thing. Many people would rather have these, you know, people remain in jail when they're, they stand accused of committing or being part of such a huge explosion. 
But the important point here is that this could actually have knock-on effects down the line uh, and, and actually kind of jeopardize the entire process. Because if you have a process with due process violations, that opens the door for, for suspects. And even if they are part of the crime, to then sort of submit appeals uh, or to just argue that, uh, you know, this whole process has been unjust. And on top of this all, uh, it's it's kind of the, the tragedy or the crime, depending on how you look at it, that keeps on giving. We found out just yesterday that a German company removed uh, or is, is has, has, you know, has completed the process of, of gathering and is going to remove a thousand tons of chemicals that are hazardous and explosive uh, from the port. And, you know, they're so hazardous that the director of the company, Combi Lift, described them as a, quote, second Beirut bomb. And and so, you know, it's it's just it kind of stands to show that, you know, many, many people had huge questions about the port. And it used to be in, you know, popularly in Lebanon, referred to as the cave of Alibaba and the 40 thieves. Because, you know, all, all the, you know, politicians and, and their associates were known to sort of split the, the spoils there. Um, but, but I don't think anybody really understood comprehensively the scale of the nightmare at the port. We now know of, uh, uh, you know, almost 4,000 tons of hazardous chemicals and explosive material that were stored at this port, which lies in the heart of the city, a city of millions of people. And, and you know, this, these materials were stored there improperly for decades. Yeah, exactly. So we basically have zero accountability. And in the meantime, okay, so at, at very least, they found that there are all of these chemicals and they are removing them. That's a good thing. But the entire process uh, and, and the fact that authorities are not uh, super transparent, to say the least about this, means that a lot of other questions come up here, you know, about what other dangers may be out there. Uh, what else do authorities maybe know about and are currently being negligent about dealing with? Uh, who knows? It is just this culture of absolute impunity for uh, the, the leaders of the country who don't have to take responsibility for literally anything, even when it goes wrong in the worst possible way. And here we are sitting six months afterwards nothing's happened and the victims are still waiting for justice. So the question is, if the politicians are not, if the leaders are not doing what they uh, should be doing as far as the investigation goes, as far as uh, COVID-19 goes and the lockdown goes, as far as protecting the most vulnerable populations goes, if they're not doing any of that, what exactly are they doing? Well, theoretically, they are supposed to be forming a government. Uh, but this process uh, has hit a few snags, uh, as we like to say. Um, it has now been, as of Monday, when uh, when you'll be listening to this, it has been 182 days without a fully empowered uh, government in Lebanon. That's the third longest stretch uh, after the uh, very long 2013 to 2014 interregnum, and then uh, the uh, one right after the 2018 elections when Hariri was trying to form a government. So Hariri was designated to form a government a bit into this, right? Uh, because we had Mustafa Adib uh, for about a month, and then Hariri was designated on October 22nd. So now it's been 109 days as of Monday since Hariri was designated. And, and this is actually, when you look at it from his perspective, maybe actually he's moving pretty quick on it uh, because he, this would be his fourth government if he's able to form one. But two out of his previous three governments took a lot longer to form. So in, in 2009, it took him 135 days to form a government. Uh, and then in 2018 to 2019, it took him 252 days to form a government. So we, we haven't even reached any of those levels yet. So and, 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 and it seems almost apparent that they, that nobody in the political class is really eager to form another government, despite the fact that you kind of need to to deal with all of these crises. Right. And and so we've seen in, in the past couple of weeks, uh, the prime minister designate Saad Hadidi kind of flying around. Uh, he went to the UAE. Uh, he went to Egypt. And now he's supposedly heading to France. And, th and this is supposedly part of his efforts to create sort of an international cover, political cover for the government that he wants to form. Uh, although it's unclear, you know, what the details are and, and what this will actually bring. Officially, in you know, the, the sort of official narrative is that the, the government formation issue is basically about, you know, free patriotic movement leader, Gibran Basile's 
absolute intention to get a third of the government, because what that allows him to do is to block any decisions. And so the logic behind that is that if, you know, Gibran Basil, who is the President Michel Aoun's son-in-law, uh, if, 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 he, if, he, if he is able to do that, this is the government that will likely remain in place until Aoun's term ends uh, in 2022. And Basile can then use his presence in the government to remain powerful and potentially secure his own rise to president, which is an ambition that he, he doesn't really deny that he has. And I think that there, there's a, a good point here about who actually is going to want Basile to be president if that is the case. Yeah, yeah exactly. He has uh, alienated most of his former partners. You know, the, the entire reason that Aoun is president today is because uh, Hariri and Jaja rallied uh, behind him rather than have Frangie uh, become president. If you talk to anybody from the future movement or from the LF, they feel like they got burned by Basile and Aoun and the Free Patriotic Movement. So there's that. Clearly, there is very deep and bad blood between Basile and Nabi Berri, which is not going to go away anytime soon, uh, given the current indications. Um, and, and so that really leaves, well, who, who are the FPM's allies here? Who are Gibran Basile's allies? And really, he has only one left, and that's Hezbollah. But even just yesterday, we're recording this Sunday, so just Saturday, the Free Patriotic Movement, on the 15-year anniversary of the Marmachael understanding, which established the ally alliance between Tayar and Hezbollah, on this anniversary, the FPM uh, released this statement saying that uh, the agreement has not lived up to expectations. Uh, we haven't been able to build a state or establish rule of law. Uh, and so it, if this agreement with Hezbollah, this bedrock agreement, is going to stick around, then it has to uh, essentially be revitalized or something needs to happen. So right now, Basile seems to be putting pressure on Hezbollah to perhaps uh, give even more at a time when he has literally no other allies in the country. Yeah, it's it's almost as if they've tried to play on all sides here, you know, a, a alliance with the LF, with Hariri, with Hezbollah, um, and, and basically through that process have kind of become toxic in a way. Um, and I think that, the, you know, the other point that we sort of have to raise, and it's, it's an open question that I, I've seen many people kind of also float, is the idea that, you know, hey, there's actually very little interest if you are top politicians to form a government today because Lebanon is heading towards a place where subsidies on medicine, wheat and fuel seem like they could be raised in the next month. You know, you have continuing protests and the promise of more protests. And, and it seems like sort of a, a sound idea politically that uh, these leaders would let Hassan Diab, the current prime minister, take these blows um, and then come in at some point when when they can you know come in as sort of a savior lebanon is a country where where, where we really do uh, seem to have you know every week kind of a day where we're remembering some event uh, usually a tragedy we do have you know a sort of a marker of time past coming up this week which is uh, on thursday it will have been one year since hassan diab's government gained confidence and i know that government if we recall came you know came to power at a time where the country was in the midst of this uprising, you know, people were calling for accountability, for the downfall of the political class, for the economy to be sort of revitalized. And Hassan Diab came in promising that he had the space to do that and that he would come in with this government of technocrats that would achieve that. It goes without saying that one year on, um, you know, the, the results have been quite miserable. The, you know, why that happened is obviously a cause of debate. Hassan Diab would say that he was prevented from doing these reforms. Others, you know, analysts would say that he actually, you know, served the purpose of deflating the uprising. But I think it's just sort of, I mean, it's just a moment to look back on, on this last year of, of Hassan Diab and, and kind of wonder what's in store for the country as, you know, as, as we move forward. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's hard to have a lot of sympathy for the, the current government, the resigned government, just because we, we see what you know, what the results have been and what have th those results been? Well, there was the, the blast at the port for which we have seen, you know, we, we saw them do basically nothing before or after. And then we see them insanely mismanaging the COVID-19 pandemic to such a level where uh, they have brought the entire healthcare system to the brink of collapse. 
And beyond that, they have uh, uh, stymied any uh, effort at accountability uh, at, uh, say, the forensic audit uh, of the central bank. They were they were not able to push that through, uh, and and to to the point where that is still maybe not dead, but uh, very much in limbo. Essentially, they have managed to get nothing done. Just you know, kick the ball down the road, and that's it. Uh, meanwhile as hundreds and hundreds of Lebanese have died on their watch. Yeah, and, uh, you know, this this whole situation of having no real government is kind of um, the perfect context for uh, the doing-nothing policy uh, that we talked about before, you know, in the episode with Alain Bifani, episode 93, I think, you know, of, of, of passing these small policies that harm people without, like, announcing any major plans, without taking responsibility for them, distributing the burden between uh, the banks and the government and the economy ministry and the central bank and all of this. Like, it's just a nasty way of, you know, taking from you without you noticing, kind of. And um, uh, this uh, this is really a central issue here because I don't think anyone, especially Hariri, wants to come in and get uh, and, and claim responsibility for the things that are being done now, especially that he doesn't have uh, a better plan or anything like that. So it's not like Hariri's government can come in and then things will get better or, you know, um, we will have an IMF deal or whatever. You know, whatever better represents to you, it's not going to happen. So I think, I feel like this is a vacuum that they are, all the political class is kind of benefiting from uh, because no one wants to be at the forefront of the decisions. Especially what we saw with this government, with the last government, the current critical government, which is that any decision they will make during these times, most decisions that they will make will be very unpopular. So uh, most of the blame has gone to the the individual ministers or whenever people who aren't who have don't have a lot of political leverage who don't make the big decisions. So to have Hariri as a prime minister taking responsibility for those would be a kind of a political mistake. So. Uh, in addition to things like Gibran Basile's quota or, or the you know the shares of each party in the government, I think we need, always need to remember that there are uh, other political calculations that a prime minister and um, and people forming governments have to take into account, especially at a moment of deep crisis like this one. Yep, and and just to note that you know that that's not conjecture. I mean, we even have organizations like you know the World Bank, which is not sort of known to be an anti-establishment organization, saying that Lebanon today is in a deliberate depression, a quote deliberate depression that is caused by the deliberate actions or inaction of the country's political and financial elite. Um, and I think that's worth something worth keeping in mind. Uh, you know. At the beginning of this podcast, I think Ben warned people in good moods. Uh, we hope we haven't put you in a deliberate depression, but <laughs> but that's just sort of the nature of of the news in Lebanon today. Yeah, if you if you thought 2020 was a catastrophic year for Lebanon, watch out because 2021 has already been shaping up uh, to be even worse. Uh, and uh, and 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 given the sort of cliffs that we're looking at, uh, potential end of subsidies, et cetera, and, and just the complete lack of political will to address the situation as it gets worse. It's hard to see how 2021 will be better. And in fact, it'll be probably significantly worse, it looks like. Yep. With this bright note, um, I think we can uh, we can wrap up this episode. <laughs> So we're sorry, going into sorry, you know, another another season of uh, of great uh, positive news. It seems on all ends. Uh, no, but kidding aside, you, you know everything is quite uncertain on all levels, and this is, I think, the general sentiment in the country. Apart from the economic level, it's also on the polit- political level and the fear of any um, you know political deterioration or military or security events, etc. So uh, it's a time in, it's a time of, of ve- great uncertainty and. And I think this will be characterizing the coming period as well, uh, especially as nothing clear has has happened on the international level yet uh, among the forces that influence uh, the country. So um, yeah, we will be following up on most of these stories, unfortunately, in the uh, in future episodes. Until then, I'm Nizar Hassan. I'm Benjamin Red. I'm Taymour Azhari. And this is the Lebanese Politics Podcast. <laughs> Thank you.
The Lebanese Politics Podcast is brought to you by myself, Nizar Hassan, Benjamin Red, produced behind the scenes by Susan Wilson, and the music is by Omar Elfil.